Dear friends, I am glad you are joining us on this new series on how to experience revival amidst the crisis. In the next few sessions, we will dwell on God's Word, the Bible, and try to make sense of what is happening in our world. But most importantly, we will reflect upon God's word with the aim of seeking a true revival. Our main text will be the book of Jonah. And I pray that this study will be a blessing for you as we dwell on God's word together. So let's turn to this interesting book that speaks of a prophet that ran away from God. But first, let us pray. Father God, as we are about to open your word, we pray for the anointing of your spirit. Bless and guide, anoint and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Only a few months ago, the joy of the New Year celebrations was ringing around the world. Everywhere, uh, we could hear best wishes of health and happiness, uh, prosperity uh, echoing from one corner to another. And here we are now, just a few months later, asking ourselves about the our very existence and survival. Yes, we live in a fast-changing world. We live in uncertain times. This sense of sudden change and uncertainty is well expressed in this poem by an Indian from Kashmir. Let me read what he wrote. We fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress and Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons and not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly, you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and can't get you the oxygen you're fighting for. Those are very profound words. Those are deep thoughts because more and more people realize today that we live on a planet in turmoil, a world in crisis. People's hearts are gripped with worry and anxiety and fear. Jesus speaks of our time in Luke 21, verse 26, when he prophesies of men's hearts failing them for fear for the things coming upon the earth. The question is, should we as Bible-centered Christians, with all our understanding of biblical prophecies, be surprised by what is happening around us? Christ in the Gospels speaks of the signs of the times especially in Matthew 24, where he lists 20 signs that will point to his second coming and the end of the world as we know it. Now we just need to read our newspapers or open our TV sets or turn on the computer screens to see that these signs are all, are all around us. Everywhere we see natural calamities, the violence, the hatred, the false teachings, the immorality that indicate 
that we are living indeed in those last days prophesied by Jesus. In Luke 24 verse 14, Jesus gives the supreme sign of his return. He says, and his gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And this is where the problem is. The church has been given the gospel to preach, but is not on fire to preach it. Too often we spend our time, our money and energy on ourselves instead of focusing our attention on those who are lost. A few years ago, a prominent minister in the US, A.W. Tozer, startled his denomination when he said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. This is the difference between today's church and the church in the New Testament. And that's why the church needs a true revival that starts with each and every one of us. As the Negro spiritual says, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father, it's me, O Lord. Not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, O Lord. And this is why, as we explore the book of Jonah, we will see that this book is speaking to us. Here is the story of a prophet who needed spiritual revival before he could be an agent of revival. Called to preach to Nineveh, Jonah said, no way. Commissioned to prophesy to this pagan nation, Jonah replied, not me. As we study the theme of revival in uncertain times, as we study the theme of revival in a times of crisis, it is my prayer that we experience revival so that we can impact the world with the gospel. Listen on how the book of Jonah starts. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I shall begin our series by calling our attention to the God of revival. Who is this God who can revive us, change and transform us. Who is this God? When we think of revival, when we think of transformation, we always need to start with God. We need to understand that true revival is not human-based. It is God-breathed. It is not a man-made thing. It is God-designed. We cannot schedule revival. We cannot generate revival by pumping our spiritual muscles. No. Revival starts with God. 
Revival comes from God. The book of Jonah opens with these interesting words. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go. The first verse introduces the main character of the entire narrative. It is not Nineveh, it is not the big fish, it is not even Jonah who is the main character. The main character in the book of Jonah is the Lord God himself. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. We are not told how it came. Was it by a dream or a vision? By inner voice or the voice of another prophet instructing him? We don't know. The Bible simply says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Yes, God knows us by name and he has a plan for our lives. And here Jonah is being called to be, not to be a king or a prime minister. He's not being called to be a priest or an officer. He's being called to be a prophet. This prophetic word, this prophetic ministry was not his own choosing. Jonah did not sit under a tree to meditate until he received divine illumination. No, 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 no. He did not evolve into a prophet through a series of spiritual discipline. No. The word of the Lord came to him. And this sequence is very important. It reminds us that when it comes to salvation, it reminds us that when it comes to the ministry, it is always God who takes the initiative. Anytime God reaches us with his word, it is by grace. Anytime we hear a word from the Lord, it is by grace. Anytime we are confronted with the gospel, it is by grace. We cannot hear a word from God without God. We cannot know God's will for this world without God. We cannot find God's truth for our lives without God. Unless God reveals his light to us, we are left in pitch darkness. Unless God reveals his love to us, we die of spiritual coldness. Unless God touches us, we cannot move. Unless God blesses us, we cannot be a blessing. We can't preach without God. We can't pray without God. We can't sing without God. We can't minister without God. We can't do anything without God. And here, Jonah is called by God, not because he was good. He was called because God is good. This reminds us that we are not chosen because of our exceptional abilities or great talents. We are not called because of our great gifts. We are called in spite of ourselves, in spite of our character, in spite of our challenges, in spite of our handicaps, in spite of our past. This is what we called. This is what we call grace. Also, when God speaks, he speaks intentionally. He speaks with a purpose in mind. God's word to Jonah was for a purpose. We read, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. 
Yes. God had in mind a specific mission for Jonah. And this brings us to our next point. When God calls us, he calls us for a mission. When God calls us, he calls us for a mission. He does not set us aside from the world. He sets us aside for the world. His word is not only for our personal benefit. His word to us is also for the good of others. God's word to us always entails a mission. The church does not exist for itself, but it exists for the world. Amazingly, the message Jonah receives was not for Israel, but for Nineveh. Why, why, why would God ask Jonah to go to Nineveh? Simple. God's call for mission always seems impossible. Now, we need to understand that God's call to us is not often an easy one. Unless we know who God is, we would find most of his plans totally absurd. Ask Abraham and Sarah. Ask Moses. Ask Peter or Paul. Imagine Jonah having to go to Nineveh. First, he would have to go on a 750 miles journey across the desert. To be in a huge city with its different language, customs and culture, Jonah found it hard to follow God's call. Why? Simply because Assyrians were reputed for skinning their victims alive, pulling their tongues, torturing and mutilating victims, and so on. Ninevites were fierce, wicked, and cruel. Would you be enthusiastic to go on such an assignment? God called Jonah to share his word to Nineveh. But what did Jonah do? Verse 3 says, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Called to get up and go to Nineveh, he got up but ran in the opposite direction. We might wonder what Jonah could be thinking. How can you flee from God who is everywhere? How do you run away from God? The psalmist says, if I ascend in heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. You can't run from God. You'll find him wherever you go. In Hebrew, it says that Jonah flee from before the face of God. Jonah wants nothing to do with God. He's not willing to serve. He's not willing to submit to God. So here Jonah decides to abandon his calling and to turn his back on God. And verse 3 says that he paid the fare to go to Tarshish. He was prepared to dig deep into his pocket to flee from the presence of God. One commentator even writes that to flee from God, Jonah had to, must have sold up his home. Can you imagine that? To flee from God, Jonah must have sold up his home, left everything behind, and set off at the risk 
of his life. But what Jonah did not know was that he was about to pay a huge price for his disobedience. In fact, the whole book is about how much it cost Jonah to disobey God. Disobedience is not free. For instance, people just in one corner of this globe did not follow God's law on what to eat. And now the whole world is in panic mode. Disobedience always has a price tag to it. Sin is not free. And when we play with it, it will cost us our life. By paying to go to Tarshish, Jonah did not simply want to flee from his task, to flee from his mission. He wanted to flee from the presence of his God. And there's an interesting connection here. To flee from God's mission is to flee from God's presence. And to flee from God's presence is to flee from God's mission. The two cannot be separated. We cannot engage in mission without the presence of God. Nor can we be in God's presence and fail to engage in mission. We cannot truly worship sing or pray, and then fail to commit ourselves to God's mission. It's impossible. Mission and the presence of God, they go together. Can we claim to love God and not be dedicated to his mission? Dear friend, can, can we decide now to, to awake from our slumber if we are not on God's mission? and save ourselves and them that are around us? Can't we do that? Is it not the time? We have everything to lose by not heeding the voice to go and make disciples of all nations and everything to gain. God is calling us to be collaborators with him. Listen to what Ellen White has to say about this. In uh, the book Evangelism, page 14, she writes, we are now living in the closing scenes of this world's history. Let men tremble with the sense of responsibility of knowing the truth. The ends of the world are come. Proper consideration of these things will lead all to make an entire consecration of all that they have and are to their God. The weighty obligation of warning a world of its coming doom is upon us. Crowns, immortal crowns, are to be won. The kingdom of heaven is to be gained. A world perishing in sin is to be enlightened. The lost pearl is to be found. The lost sheep is to be brought back in safety to the fold. Who will join in the search? Who will bear the light to those who are wandering in the darkness of error? Friends, our Lord wants to bless us. He wants to use us for His glory. He wants to revive us and change us and transform us for too long. We have depended on our own strength. For too long we have trusted in our own plans and strategies. For too long we have lived as if we could make it on our own. Now. Now is the time to wake up from our slumber. 
these days in which we live are uncertain ones. But God invites us to humble our hearts before Him. He invites us to seek, to plead for His forgiveness for our neglect to fulfill the Gospel Commission. Will you seek the Lord? Will you follow Him? Will you surrender to Him? Let us pray. Lord, we pray for revival. We pray that you will change and transform us for the glory of your name. For we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a pleasure to share God's word with you. Until the next time we meet, continue reading chapter 1. My next subject will be can a crisis minister to your soul? Can a crisis minister to your soul? And remember, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. May God bless you.